Holy Spirit, we invite your presence to lead us. We want your spirit to speak to our heart. We want your presence to teach us this morning. Take control of our heart. It's all about you, Lord Jesus, this morning. We want to feel more of you this morning. Our heart belongs to you. And it is for this purpose you have called us. Even as we are about to listen to the reading of your word, let your word speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. He's pointing at something, but I can't see. Is she? She went out. I'm carrying on. (laughs) Okay, I'm carrying on. We have two readings this morning. The first is from Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. Now, this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, And it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as the frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And from Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were not aware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they travelled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understandings and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you very much. Last week, for the past two weeks, we've been looking at McBreen's book, Oil Economics. And for those who are here for the very first time, Oil Economics is coming from two Greek words, oikos and nomos. And what McBreen's was trying to put across is this concept that the household of God has certain five capitals. And these capitals comes together for the serving or for the service of which God has called all of us. 
So he put up five capitals. But one may ask, what is the meaning of this oil economics? The oikos, which is a Greek word which means household. And the nomos, another Greek word which also means to manage. So in context, we are looking at how as a household of God, we can make use of the resources that God has put in individually, us, for the benefit of the mission that God has called all of us. So he put up these five capitals, and last two weeks, came started with the very first capital, spiritual capital. And with the spiritual capital, we were looking at knowing God intimately and having access to his wisdom and power at the chief point of life. This is how my brain put it. The spiritual capital is the first and ultimate one in our spiritual journey. Such that before we can call ourselves Christians or before we can call ourselves followers of God or people of faith, first we have to have this capital. It's our relationship with God, listening to God's word and putting them in practice. Listening to what God has said, listening and knowing what God has said about you, and practicalizing them. So in John 17, verse 3, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So this is the very first capital. Knowing Jesus Christ, knowing that it is through Jesus Christ that we call ourselves followers of God. And that is what the first one that we spoke about last two weeks. And last week, we moved on to the physical, the physical capital. And the physical capital has to do with the time and energy available for us to invest. And this is measured by the hours and the wealth or health that we have. And we saw how God himself, wanting to make himself known to us, has to come to us physically. God invested in himself in a form of Jesus Christ, his son, to appear in a human form for us to witness and know who God actually is. So God invested in physical capital, coming in a form of his own son for us to know him. So whenever we talk about God, it's not the God in the Old Testament that they have no idea of who God physically looked like. But in Jesus Christ, we saw God himself with us, experiencing God, the, the compassionate God, not the imagery of the kind of God we all know in the Old Testament. So God came in a human form. And for our discussion today, we are moving on to the next capital, which is intellectual capital. Next week, we may move back up there to relational capital, where Joy will lead us through. With the intellectual capital, what are we looking at? How much creativity, ideas, knowledge we have to invest. And the currency of this capital is the concept and ideas, information and application. How much information do we have? The, our ideas, things that we know. How are we going to use these things that we know? the resources that you are made up of, the very thing that you can do, 
You know who you are. Your talents. The very things that you like doing, you have knowledge of. Someone can say, I'm a teacher. Someone can say, I'm a doctor. Wherever profession you find yourself, or whatever you know doing, that is the intellectual capital you possess. And this is what we are looking at. How are we going to use this creativity, these ideas that we have, this knowledge that we have, how are we going to invest these things in our various callings that Jesus has called us into? In our various areas that God has called us to serve, how are we going to use these things in a way that will be much more beneficial to the way that God has called us? That is why in the first reading, we saw how God appeared in Exodus with the, Pentate- with the law, with the Torah. How he appeared to his people with the Torah. Then between Numbers and Leviticus, You see the tension there, God trying to give some kind of tradition to his people. How they can lead their life. Now, getting to Deuteronomy, God knew that the people are about to enter into the promised land. Therefore, he made specifically in our reading to tell the Israelites that, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love, Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Everything about you, everything that you possess, everything that you are made of, love your God with everything that you have. Serve God with everything that you have. Devote all your time for God with everything that you have. And these words which I command you today shall be part, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk to them when you sit in your house. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So you see the interaction of spiritual capital, God telling the Israelites that it's about time for them to sit down to impart the intellectual knowledge that they have acquired to their descendants. It is about time for the Israelites, now you have known who I am. I've dealt with you very well. You know who I am. I've given you all the law, the the traditions, and the things that you need to do. I've given everything to you. Now, this is about the time that you have to impart this relationship that I have with you to your descendants. That spiritual capital that you have downloaded from me, I am also expecting you to transfer the same thing to your descendants, imparting the knowledge to the descendants, intellectual capital. So God was very, very specific to the Israelites, what kind of things God is expecting them to impart. And our Christian journey constitute this relationship with God, our vertical relationship with God. And this is what I like the way Um, Bill Bright in his um, five principles of growth set this thing up. Our first relationship is with God and we communicate with God through our interaction with God's word, through our study with God's word, through our listening to the the word of God and our communication with God is the vertical one through our prayer. We speak to God through our prayer. We pray to God. We communicate with God. We have God as our friend. And that is the first one, the vertical relationship that 
he was talking about. For us to have this intellectual capital, it is not just an head knowledge. It is not just an accumulation of knowledge. It is not just things that we have read, but it is the, it is the kind of things that we know, we know, we have received from God that we possess, that belongs to us. That belongs to us because God has made us in his image. And when we have this relationship, it is not ourselves who sit in the hearts, in our heart again. But in the picture as you have, through obedience of, with God's word, through God's word, we have God sitting on the very seat of our heart. And you see the self, myself, just at the foot of Jesus. So it is no more myself, but God. On the flip side of it, sometimes I just look at the way sometimes people sit in a chair, the way you've relaxed, the confidence you have in the chair that you are sitting on. I wish we can have the same confidence in God one day. That we, 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 we you don't know who even put this thing down. <laughs> you don't know what, whether it is strong or not. But you just come in here knowing that you know that this chair will never fail you. So you hurriedly sit on without even realizing that it can disappoint you. This is how God sometimes wants us to relax in him. He wants us to know that he is part of us. And when this relationship through obedience of God's word, we don't keep the word to ourselves. We share. So you see that fellowship, how he put it up there. It is fellowship. We fellowship, we share the knowledge that we have, the capital that we have, the things that we know, the word that we've read, the word of God that is in us. We don't sit on it. We fellowship with one another. And it's not just an knowing that you know from Genesis up to Revelation, but a little that God speaks to your heart. The little word that you know a friend needs. The little word that you can share with a very friend sitting beside you. Sometimes just share that. That is how we fellowship. After acquiring this knowledge, this relationship, after establishing this relationship with our God, our intellectual capital is such that after getting this thing, another one is to witness and last week, I think, we, we went back to our vision and we reflect a little bit on that. But when Jesus sits in your heart, it is not you, but it's all about others. What others are going through. You will not sit down on concern if you see someone suffering. You will not sit down on concern if you see someone in a very tight corner. Because Jesus sits in your heart. It is not uncharacteristic of the God that we serve. He knows how the world is suffering. Had it not been that, God wouldn't have invested physically in Jesus to come down in a form of you and I. So after that, he says, go out. You go out to the world to witness and we just thank God for what we are all trusting and genuinely believing where God is taking us to. Our discipleship journey. Our discipleship journey. Our church planting journey that we are all trusting God. That God is going to use our resources, our um, capitals that we have to reach out to the world, to our neighborhood, to share. Because what Mike Green was saying that is that all these capitals are not given to us just because they belong to us. God invests too much in us, not for our own personal gains, but so that we can be a blessing to one another. 
so that we can be a blessing to one another. That is the very reason why we have been called. So in Proverbs, it says that fear, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. So the fear of the Lord is the relationship of this very, he put it in asterisk, discipleship intellectual capital. The fear of the Lord. It's not a kind of fear where you are playing and you see your mom or you see your supervisor, you have to pretend. It's not a kind of fear when you, you, you're doing something secretly and when you see someone and it's like, oh, you just have to change the dynamics. It is the fear that knowing that God is love, knowing that God is very compassionate, knowing that God journey with each and everyone, irrespective of who you are. God is not after your perfectionism. God knows that we are not perfect. God knows it. So this fear of the Lord is knowing that God has really called me for a purpose. God has invested in me for a purpose. God has something special for me for a purpose. And for that purpose, it's not just for ourselves. It's for each other. And I like the way Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 118, for the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing, but for us who are being saved. And I like the way he said, for us who are being saved, it is not for us who are saved. We are in a process of being saved. We are in a process of being saved. We are all journeying. We haven't reached there yet. We are working the same Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Yes. So it's a genuine process. It's a genuine process. He said, for us, it is the power of God having that knowledge, that intellectual capital is very important. Knowing that God is with you. And when God invested in his physical capital, as I said, we saw God coming down. So many times when we read this very word of God coming down, we focus knowing that God is with us. God is with us. And in the gospel, there was a story of Jesus at the age of 12 years with his parents. They went for a Passover and afterwards, Mary and then maybe Joseph kind of having fun. <laughs> uh, just as a creation anyway. So they forgot that Jesus was with them. So they were just going, 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 thinking that Jesus was with them. And after a certain level, they realized that Jesus was not with them. Where is Jesus? Where is our son? So they have to go back again looking for Jesus. And I like the way the gospel put it up. It says they were moving around for three days looking for Jesus, the boy Jesus. And when they went to the temple, they saw the boy Jesus sitting down with Christ. And whenever we read this very story, we only think of the boy Jesus going to the temple, questioning the rabbis and the teachers. But the reading goes further to say that after this very interaction, Jesus grew in wisdom. After Jesus engaging himself, questioning the rabbis, questioning the teachers, questioning the priests, the high priest, he was engaging in interaction with them. And part of this interaction is not for Jesus' own doing. This interaction, 
Jesus knew that he has to commit himself to investing in intellectual capital because he needs to learn and apply this learning in the mission his father has assigned him for. So as a young boy of 12 years, he knew he has to sit down and learn. And we define intellectual capital, part of it, we said, is a concept, idea. And part of Jewish time has to do with a tradition. So Jesus, for him to start a very meaningful work, has to sit down at a temple. And just think of it, for three days in a temple, learning, 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 learning. And what that does also speak to us. And it is of no surprise to me because when Jesus acquired this knowledge in all the four gospels, in Matthew 4, verse 23, it says, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing everyone, every kind of diseases and every kind of sickness among the people. Teachers, Jesus was teaching, teaching in the synagogue. Because Jesus acquired this knowledge, sitting in a temple, he has to transfer the knowledge. Jesus was teaching. And when we go to Mark, Mark 6, 34, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. And afterwards, what did Jesus do? He began to teach them many things. So Jesus acquired this knowledge, this intellectual knowledge. He did not sit down. He has to transfer. That is why I said the intellectual capital that we get is not for ourselves is for us to share. I can't imagine a doctor having a, a professional qualification and choosing just to serve himself. I can't imagine. I'm a teacher. I have had all my qualification and all my, I don't know here, we use ticket or whatever it is, all my certificates done. These are my certificates. And you say, I will not teach. You put it, all the certificates under your bed. Then you expect the government to pay you. Is it possible that way? Jesus acquiring this knowledge, this wisdom in Mark, he taught with compassion. In Luke 24, verse 27, then beginning with Moses, and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. He explained. I don't think you can just explain things if you don't have the knowledge of what you are speaking of. So Jesus has this knowledge. And in John gospel, early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people were coming to him and he sat down and again, you see Jesus there teaching them. So the capital that we gain intellectually is for the benefit of transferring this knowledge to one another. When sometimes it comes to issues of gospel, I think, it is so often I do sometimes. So I, I'm not that well versed in the part of scripture which says A or B. I'm not that good in the part of scripture which says C or D. But at least I know what my friend is going through. I know what someone I'm working with is going through. And I don't need a specific Word of God, specifically for such a person. It's just for me to show the person love. And out of love, 
you speak to the person in the situation the person finds him or herself. And we are aware of someone. The psalmist started talking about blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of ungodly. And later on in verse 3, he said, such a person is like a tree planted by the riverside. He brings forth its fruit in its season. And the leaves of such tree will never wither. When Jesus is in you, when Jesus is sitting in your heart, you are just like a tree planted by the riverside. You don't wait for a certain season before we share what we know. You don't wait for a certain season before we share love. You don't wait for a certain season before we speak good things upon people's life. We don't wait for a certain season before we think that, oh, I cannot say this. But no, you say this out of love to your friend, to your neighbor, to your person sitting beside you, wherever you find yourself. Jesus possessed an astonishing level of intellectual capital. He possessed an astonishing level of intellectual capital. And you see a glimpses of that too in, in most of the gospel. In Mark 15 verse 5, but Jesus made no further answer. So Pilate was amazed. He didn't even say anything. But <laughs> Pilate was amazed. In Luke 4, 22, and all were speaking well of him and wondering as a gracious words which this man Jesus was saying. And some were even asking, is this not Joseph's son. In Matthew 7, when Jesus had finished all these words, the crowd were amazed because he thought as someone with wisdom. In John 7, the Jews then were astonished, saying, How has this man become learned? Have you never been educated? See, so there, there was this kind of tension. And forgetting that at the age of 12 years, this person, this being, this very loving God sat beneath the feet of rabbi, learning. So it's about time for him to also impart this intellectual knowledge. And in Jewish tradition. You can't just be called a teacher. You can't just be called a rabbi. But Jesus was being referred to a teacher. And I remember in John's gospel, when Mary, after Jesus' resurrection, saw Jesus, he called Jesus Rabboni. Rabboni. My rabbi. Presupposing that he was seen as a teacher. When we receive this intellectual knowledge, intellectual wisdom, and however you want, really want to put it, it's for the benefit of others. He was constantly explaining his parables to his disciples, teaching them to understand the kingdom of God at a very deep level. Constantly, constantly, constantly. And one thing I just want us to conclude with is that when we receive the word of God, when we have the word of God in our heart, when we have the word of God in us, when the word of God is in us, and we don't allow the Holy Spirit to journey alongside with what we know, it just becomes head knowledge. But when we allow the Holy Spirit to take control of what we know of, we experience transformation. We experience transformation. And this is what I really want to recommend and trusting God that whatever journey you find ourselves, 
whatever knowledge that we have, let's be for the benefit of sharing it among ourselves. Shall we pray? And I don't know where you find yourself or where you sit with this message. Yes, the minute, reflect on what this word means to you in your own personal journey.